Mm -hmm. Well, good morning. Really good to see you this morning. Good to see the sanctuary uh, well filled on this uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. And folks are still coming in. You're welcome online uh, if you're watching us today. Uh, can I just uh, begin with a few announcements uh, for us? Uh, the young people are obviously uh, in the, uh, the Makahi Hall there. Uh, they're in a separate program. And we'll allow the parents after uh, the service is over, uh, we'll allow the parents to go and, and collect them first of all, uh, please. Uh, tea and coffee after the service, uh, which is going to be fun today, but uh, it is there. Uh, and the two hatches, uh, please do stay around for uh, some chat and fellowship. Uh, next Sunday morning, uh, we're back to 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. Service this evening is going to be led by the young people from the movement. Uh, so please, if you're available this evening, please do come out half past six as we continue to celebrate uh, the resurrection. Uh, tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday, the church office is closed with the bank holidays, uh, so just to, to note that. And uh, we've had a, a very good Holy Week. I want to thank Rowan for leading us in our devotions as we looked at various women of, of Holy Week. And it has been good to see so, uh, such good numbers out at the lunch times and at the evening. And for those uh, who came to the lunchtime, we enjoyed a lovely soup lunch, so thank you to the teams uh, each day who catered for us. Uh, thanks also to the creative team for all that they're doing, these beautiful displays for Easter, and uh, we thank them, the tech team, and obviously the musicians, uh, Rachel and Jill and the choir, for all the preparation that has gone into uh, this weekend. It's very much appreciated. We had a super lovely service on Good Friday evening. It's uh, still available if you wish to watch it on YouTube if you weren't uh, able to be here. But we're looking forward to today with uh, expectancy, uh, a very, very special day. And we join uh, just before the choir uh, sing their first piece. Uh, traditionally, uh, the church through the years and through the ages has declared that Christ is risen. If you would respond in the words in yellow. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
Let us all pray. Lord, we celebrate the great truth that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And we celebrate this day where everything changed, not only for the disciples on that first Easter Sunday, but for us as well. And we bless you that the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in us, and He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies. Father, we know that much of our world, and indeed sometimes ourselves, we can live lives tinged with darkness and despair. But today we are reminded that Christ is risen, that He has defeated even the last enemy, death itself, and He is seated at the right hand of God the Father and will return. Christ is risen, so sin has been dealt with. Christ is risen, so joy and purpose and meaning fill our hearts. Christ is risen, and we have victory over the evil one. Christ is risen, and death no longer has a hold upon us. Christ is risen, and the Holy Spirit has been released upon the church. Christ is risen, and we have been commissioned to go with this good news of the gospel that Jesus has died, but Jesus is alive. Lord, help us to turn from our sin, to live in the truth of Easter Sunday, and to run with persever perseverance the race that you have set out before us. As once again, as resurrection people, we have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead as we seek to live our lives for you. Lord, you are worthy of all our praise, all the honor, all the respect. You are worthy of it all. And so we praise you today as millions do throughout this world today. We praise Jesus, the risen King, who has changed everything. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, the first of our readings this morning is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that's page 1155, if you've got a pew Bible there. And uh, Peter Brown is going to read that for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. The Resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed.
Our second reading is in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verses 1 to 18. That's page 1089. And uh, Carl Kane is going to come and read that for us. And then after this, the choir will sing Because of Jesus. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb, both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. So Simon Peter, who was ahead of him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't even know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned round to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she told them. And she told them that he had said these things to her.
Thanks to the choir for uh, <clears throat> ministering to us so well. Uh, this morning I want us to uh, think about the day that changed the world. From time to time, people look over the span of the centuries and, and postulate what are the most important uh, world-shaping events in history. Uh, Howell Harris, in his book, 50 History Making, Making Days, includes events in his book like the Battle of Waterloo, the assassination of Julius Caesar, the passing of the Emancipation Act, the bombing of Hiroshima, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and the attack on the Twin Towers, the 11th of September, 2001. He also does mention the life of Jesus Christ. In various times, people have also suggested that great inventions have changed the world. Things like the invention of printing, the abolition of slavery, the first powered flight, the discovery of penicillin, the first man in space, and of course the invention of the internet. Some years ago, an American publishing house brought together a panel of 28 educators and historians and asked them to select the 100 most significant events of history and to list those events in order of importance. After months of labor, the panel reported that they considered the most significant event of history to be the discovery of America. But then, what would you expect of Americans? In second place was the invention of movable type by Gutenberg. Eleven different events tied for third place, and five events tied for fourth, pla for fourth place. The events tying for fourth were the writing of the Constitution of the United States, the development of ether, the development of the X-ray, the discovery of the airplane, and the life of Jesus of Nazareth. While some of these listings and, and books refer to Jesus or his life, very few actually refer to his death or to his resurrection. And yet, of course, we would say that his death and his resurrection are the most of momentous events in history. They are world-defining and history-changing. And this is why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 mentions the resurrection, among other things, as of first importance. It is absolutely vital. And in fact, later on in that chapter, chapter 15, the Apostle Paul goes on to say that if the resurrection did not happen, our faith is futile. We might as well close the churches because everything hinges on the fact did Jesus rise from the grave? Many battles, wars, inventions, and speeches have had an impact on humankind over the centuries. But surely this weekend, which we call Easter, is the most significant because it not only impacts time and history, but it impacts eternity. Today we celebrate an event that spans the centuries and has eternal significance. H.G. Wells, speaking about great men of history, said of Jesus, more than 1,900 years later, a historian like myself, who doesn't even call himself a Christian, finds the picture centering irresist irresistibly around the life and the character of this most significant man. The historian's test of an individual's greatness is what did he leave to grow? Did he start people thinking along fresh lines with a, a vigor that persisted after him? And by this test, Jesus stands first. You can gauge the size of a ship that has passed out of sight by the huge wake that it leaves behind. And Jesus has left a huge wake behind him. He has even changed our calendars. This year is the year of the Lord. 2024. Over these last weeks, we have been looking at the Gospel of John, and latterly, we've been looking at the second half of the Gospel under the overall heading of Signs of Glory. And as we read John chapter 20, we see the glory is very, very evident. On this Resurrection Sunday, I want us just for a few moments to meditate on Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John as they came to the tomb that day. In John 20, as indeed in the other gospel accounts of Easter Sunday, 
uh, we come to the realization that for all of the people involved, uh, though Jesus had often talked about rising on the third day, they had not really taken it in. Perhaps their eyes had glazed over and they were not really listening to what he was saying. Even after bringing Lazarus to life again, they still did not fully comprehend the reality of Jesus rising on the third day. They loved him. They respected him as a teacher. Their individual worlds fell apart upon his trial and death. But none of them, none of them decided on that Sunday morning, let us go to the tomb and see if it is empty. Let's see if what Jesus predicted and prophesied would come to pass. The woman came to the tomb to anoint a dead body. They fully expected the tomb to be occupied. Peter and the rest of the disciples were in fear, hiding from the authorities. The last thing they were going to do was go to the tomb. They did not expect Jesus to rise, even though he had been saying it, especially over the past week. So they were going with no sense of expectation in the air. A cold blast of reality of Easter Saturday had filled their hearts and minds. Their world was dark and faithless. Matthew Arnold, in his poem, Dover Beach, in a sense, describes the kind of Easter Saturday feeling that the world lives in most of the time. Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. The woman and the disciples were living in the despair and fear and gloom of Easter Saturday. Where to look, where to go, what to do. The last thing in their minds for some reason was that Jesus would not rise again. And so Mary, on that Sunday morning, as she returns to the tomb, she's on autopilot to weep, to watch, to pray. But in her dedication, she will be granted the first sighting of an empty tomb and of Jesus. And yet her first thought still was, his body has been stolen. Bishop Ryle says her tears were needless. Her anxiety was unnecessary. Like Hagar in the wilderness, she had a well of water by her side, but she had not eyes to see it. So low was she, and we can get into these low places as well, so despairing was she that her faith was all but extinguished, and all that she can report is they have stolen his body. But Jesus is gracious. He is gracious to Mary, and he's gracious to us. And he granted her a vision of himself. In her traumatized state, she thinks he's the gardener. She does not see Jesus. But Jesus comes to her and meets her at her point of need. And he calls her by name, Mary. And that one word is all that is needed. Mary. John chapter 10 and verse 3 tells us that the good shepherd knows us and he calls us by name. And whenever he calls us by name, we recognize his voice. When the risen Jesus calls us by name, our world changes, and we move from confusion to trust. Mary had the great privilege of being the first person that the risen Jesus spoke to, and finally she sees, she really sees. People can go through their whole adult lives, and they miss the resurrection. They miss the significance of this day. And this is why Paul the Apostle says the resurrection is of first importance. Philip Yancey says a cross without an empty tomb would be merely tragic. Plenty of good men and women have lived, loved, and died, but only one has come back after death with a promise to conquer death forever and to make all things new. But not only did Mary's world change, so also did the disciples' world. 
She reports to them that the tomb is empty, and Peter and John rush to the site of the tomb. And John's account has little details that are evidence that he was an eyewitness there. He outruns Peter, but also tentatively he keeps his distance, not going in. Peter pushes on in ahead of him, and then he sees that the grave clothes are folded up. They were still dull and slow to believe. I think it is important again to know that there was no gullibility here. There was not even a predisposition to believe. While they saw what they saw, they still needed more evidence to believe in the resurrection. Like Mary, they were not expecting a resurrection despite all that Jesus had said. Resurrection was so anti their culture. The Greeks and the philosophers of the day did not believe in resurrection. For them at most, the afterlife was liberation of the soul from the body. Tim Keller says, for the Greeks, resurrection, resurrection would never be part of life after death. As for the Jews, some of them believed in a future general resurrection when the entire world would be renewed, but they had no concept of an individual rising from the dead. The people of Jesus' day were not predisposed to believe in the resurrection any more than people today. But John and Peter's world did change. Though later they were found locked in an upper room, Jesus did appear to them personally. Thomas had the opportunity to place his fingers into the scars and the wounds of Jesus' body. And after them, 500 people witnessed Jesus Christ. There is something about our human nature that leans towards pessimism and anxiety and fear. We are told that our current generation is one that is especially anxious. And indeed, as we look at our world, there is not a lot to be optimistic about. We see growing talk of war. We continue to work through the after effects of a pandemic. NHS waiting lists are growing longer. Fewer crimes seem to be solved. And overall, the level of anger and rage seems to be growing. And respectful dialogue is diminishing. The Christian church was born out of the despair of Easter Saturday. It moved from fear and confusion to the place of hope and faith because of the resurrection. This day of all days changed everything for Mary, changed everything for Peter and for the disciples, and it can change everything for us. Here we are 2,000 years later singing and proclaiming a crucified but risen Savior. We are living in an increasingly secular world, but here and there we see green shoots of recovery, green shoots of faith as people begin to believe in Jesus. I was just reading this week an article in the Spectator magazine by Justin Brearley. Justin Brearley is a Christian, a commentator. He's on the media, and he writes this, as a believing Christian, I see signs that God is moving in the minds and hearts of secular intellectuals. Many of them are recognizing that secular humanism has failed, and against all their expectations seem to be on the verge of embracing faith instead. Some have actually become Christians. The author and poet Paul Kingsnorth surprised his readership when he announced his conversion in 2021. Russell Brand is now calling himself a Christian. He says he plans to get baptized. Ayan Hirsi Ali, a well-known Muslim, says she has now embraced Christianity after realizing she was spiritually bankrupt. The tech pioneer Jordan Hall recently went public about his conversion to Christianity. And many of these people mention the influence of Tom Holland's thesis that Christianity is the foundation on which the ethics of the West sit. People keep predicting the death of the church in the West. G.K. Chesterton says, Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. I'm not sure how this Easter finds you. Content? Indifferent? Anxious? However it finds you, Know this, that what happened on Easter Sunday has changed the world. Nothing is now the same. 
we have the good news as declared by Paul of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, but He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And He has appeared to Peter, to the twelve, and to many other during those days before His ascension. And so today, on Easter Sunday, 2024, we declare Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. The world has been changed because of this day. Jesus is alive, and we will not be silent about this day of all days that has changed the world. Let us pray. And Father, as we wait in the stillness and the silence of this place, we allow the truth that Jesus is alive to sink into our hearts once more with a new freshness, with a new vitality. Lord, strengthen the faith of those who are weak. Comfort those who mourn. Draw near to help those to persevere. We pray, O God, for all those known to us who are going through times of difficulty. They're living in the Easter Saturday. We pray that the hope, the truth, and the joy of a risen Jesus Christ through Your Spirit will abide in their hearts. And we will hear today and in the days to come, through His Spirit, Jesus the Good Shepherd, whispering our names calling us to Himself, letting us know that He's alive, He's with us, He's within us by His Spirit. And from this day forward, everything changes. Hallelujah. We worship a risen Savior. To You be the glory, the honor, the praise, and the power, both now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. And we close with that uh, great hymn of praise and faith in Christ alone. My hope is fine. We stand to worship.
say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you. Uh, if you could let the parents go and get the children, first of all, that would be really good. Have a good Easter. <laughs>